Our subject tonight is the sure mercies of David. Now Solomon is praying. He's dedicating the temple. And he's asking God to remember David. To remember David's afflictions. Remember how David vowed and he did the work to retrieve the ark and to restore worship in Judah. And he is doing this. It's a picture of us coming to God and in the name of our Lord Jesus, coming to the Father and asking the Father to remember Christ, remember his afflictions and his work. And the reason Solomon is asking God to remember David is because God made a covenant with David. And the covenant that God made with David was entirely concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and what Christ would do and how Christ would fulfill all the promises of God. We saw Sunday, God said he gave Christ to be a covenant to the people. Everything's fulfilled in Christ. Now this time we're going to hear the sure mercies of David. We're going to hear God's covenant to David and we're going to hear the promises of uh, to David, and, and these are all in our Lord Jesus. Let's just begin in verse 11, and I'm just going to go a little at a time here, but he says in verse 11, the Lord has sworn in truth unto David. He will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. God's covenant to David had some temporal promises and it had some spiritual promises. In a temporal way, the promise was to David and his throne and the children of Israel, and it involved some temporal things that God would do for them. But God was doing all of that for Israel in the temporal way as a greater picture of the spiritual promise. And that's what's the important thing here is the spiritual promise. These promises were in Christ, the covenant is Christ, and the promises are all in Christ. They were to David, and they're to God's elect church. That's who they're to, David's true children. Just like Abraham's true sons were are the spiritual sons of Abraham, David's true Israel was the spiritual Israel that God saves from Jew and Gentile, you who are resting in Christ by his grace. And God worked all the temporal to give us the picture of the spiritual. That's how sovereign God is, to paint us this picture of all these spiritual blessings we have in Christ. Now, first of all, God made covenant with David and with his children. He said here in verse 11, The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. God cannot lie. And he swore in truth to David. He made a promise to David. He confirmed it with an oath. And God will never break his covenant to David. He'll never break his covenant to the Lord Jesus or to any of his people. Now, temporally speaking, God promised that from David would come a long line of kings. That was going to come to pass in a temporal way. In verse 11, he said, Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. The first temporal earthly king was Solomon. And David gave God the glory for giving him Solomon. David said in 1 Kings 1 and verse 48, he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which hath given one to sit on my throne this day, mine eyes even seeing it. Solomon, you remember, he, he built the temple where the ark we saw last time. He said there in, in, uh, in uh, verse Verse 8, Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. That, that was at the dedication of the temple. He had built that temple, and they were taking the ark of the covenant up into the holiest of holies where God promised to make his presence known, to meet with his people over the mercy seat. But the promise, and this was all fulfilled because God made this covenant to David. Now, all these temporal things happened because God made this promise to David. But the promise that God made to Israel required obedience to the law. Look there in verse 12. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony, that's the law, 
if they'll keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. God promised to teach them, and God fulfilled his side of the covenant. God, God promised, and God did everything he promised. He gave Moses and the prophets. God did that. He gave, he gave them instruction. He taught them the law. He, he sent Moses, and he taught them what the law said. He used his prophets to teach them what the law said. Remember at Sinai, when, when they, Moses came down, and he talked about this law and this covenant, and the children of Israel said, everything the, the Lord commands, we will do it. They entered a covenant and said, we will keep the law. We will do all the law and the testimony. But they didn't keep their side of the covenant. They broke the law. They had broken it when Moses came down with the commandments. Now, brethren, that was no surprise to God at all. Some blasphemously teach that that, that was plan A and then God had to go to plan B. That's not so. God gave the law at Sinai to give a knowledge of sin. He gave the law at Sinai to give a knowledge of sin. Scripture is so clear on that. By the law is the knowledge of sin. We'd already broken the law in Adam. They'd already broken it in Adam. They were already conceived in sin in their mother's womb, just like you and me and everybody else that comes into this world. So there was no way they were going to be able to keep that law. Now, let's look to Christ, and let's see what the true spiritual fulfillment of this is. David is a type of Christ. Now, in eternity, God chose Christ. He chose his son to be the Christ and to be the king. And he chose a people from all nations and tribes that would be in this world. He chose a people to be his elect Israel, his spiritual Israel. And he made his son, the Christ, the Savior, and the King over this people in eternity. Now spiritually, by grace, by grace, spiritually, God promised David that the true King would come through his lineage. The true king would come through his lineage and that would be the king God was set up on his holy hill of Zion. He said in verse 11, of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. As I read that, it, <laughs> Christ is the one teaching David because he's the mediator between God and men. And read how that reads, of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. God set his son on his throne, but Christ is the one that came through David, and he's the one who set himself on that throne. Spiritually, this speaks of one king. It speaks of David's king, David's Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Go with me to Acts chapter 2. Uh, Peter preached this on the day of Pentecost. See, because they were carnal, Religious as they could be, but because they were carnal, they were looking for a temporal king to sit on David's temporal throne in, in a temporal kingdom, save them out from under Rome. That's all they needed. They just needed to be saved from Rome. They didn't need to be saved spiritually from their sin, they thought. So Peter stood up and declared the spiritual truth of everything that God had declared to David and everything Israel was and what the throne was about, he declared the spiritual meaning of it all. Look here, Acts 2 and verse 30. He said, Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did, did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. For David's not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly 
that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. He's king. He's the true King David. And he's Christ. He's the Savior. Just like God chose David to be king over temporal Israel in eternity, God chose his son and anointed him the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of his people, and the king over his spiritual Israel. Just like Solomon came through David and he built that, that more permanent temple, our Lord Jesus Christ came through David and he builds God's true habitation, God's true house. He builds it. And so according to God's promise, remember God, he chose Judah, he chose Mount Zion, he chose David's lineage, and he promised the scepter shall not depart from Judah. The king, kingly scepter shall not depart till Shiloh come. And it didn't. It didn't. But when Christ the king came, that put an end to all of what uh, that picture, there's no use for the picture anymore. The, the real thing had come. The express image. Christ who had all pictured had come. Now, Christ built the real house. He built the temple of God. He built the house in which God dwells, the habitation in which God dwells. Now, how did he do this? Well, if you're going to build a temple, the first thing, or any structure for that matter, the first thing you have to do is lay a foundation. And the Lord Jesus Christ laid the foundation. He laid the foundation. He fulfilled the law for his people. Remember God said, verse 12, If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. And so the Lord Jesus Christ became a man like unto his brethren. And he came for the purpose of keeping that covenant for all God's elect Israel. He came to fulfill that law for all God's people because we could not fulfill it. We couldn't keep our end of the covenant. He's God fulfilling, fulfilling uh, the covenant for God and he's man fulfilling the covenant for his elect people. And he's bringing God and his people together in him. Go back to Psalm chapter 40. It's amazing to me how that God used David to pen the very words of David's Savior. <laughs> and that's how God taught David the gospel. David, Peter just said, David knew these things. David was a prophet and knew Christ was his righteousness and his Lord and his, and his Christ. He knew it. And look, God taught David the gospel this way. This is David writing, but he's speaking of Christ. Look here in Psalm 40, verse 6. The Lord Jesus says, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. None of that was meant to save. It was for pictures and types. He said, Mine ears hast thou opened. Burn offering and sin offering hast thou not required. You see, Christ, look at Christ here as the man representing all God's elect. God opened his ear just like he opened your ear and taught him. He, he, Christ wasn't spiritually dead like you and me are. I, I hesitate to even put, say those words, but he was he. But he did receive the the spirit was given to him just like to you, and the spirit he was taught and he grew up. He was taught, and he learned, and he said, "You open my ear, and you show me those sacrifices and offerings you weren't pleased with. You never meant to save by those." Then said I, "Lo, I come." In the volume of the book, it's written of me. The whole Bible is about the Lord Jesus. Everything God was saying through Moses and the prophets, he was saying about Christ. The volume of the book, it's written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. We saw that's, that's the picture of the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant had the unbroken law of God in it. That's why it's such a beautiful picture of Christ. Christ said, thy law is in my heart. I came to do thy will, O God. And, and so he came to fulfill the gospel, fulfill the, the law, the covenant, the old covenant, and to bring us under the everlasting covenant of grace. And the other thing he did in laying this foundation is he, 
He established his apostles with the gospel and sent them forth preaching the gospel. That's how he would bring us into the covenant of grace. Look at verse 9. Psalm 40, verse 9. I've preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lord, I've not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I've not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I've declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I've not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great con congregation. So this is how the foundation was laid. By Christ fulfilling the law on behalf of his people, Christ sanctified his people by his one offering. That's what, you recognize that from Hebrews 10. So he, the Hebrew writer just quoted Psalm 40. Christ said, it says, He taketh away the first. He fulfilled that law. He took it away from His people by fulfilling it and that He may establish the second, the everlasting covenant of grace. And it says, By the which will, by Him doing the will of God, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ one time. But like Solomon after you laid the foundation and you're building the temple, the next thing you do is you start putting the stones together. They, they, they put no tool on those stones while they were in the temple. They did that somewhere else and they brought the stones to the temple and they put the stones on the foundation and they put another stone and they would just rub that stone down in between the other stone and fitly frame those stones together. That's how they made the temple. 1 Peter 2.5 says, You also as lively stones, living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You come in here tonight, we just offered up some spiritual sacrifices to God. We sang praises to His name. We, we pray and give thanks to Him. Those are spiritual sacrifices. We fall down and try to worship Him spiritual sacrifices, giving Him all the praise and all the glory for our salvation. And anything we do, whether it's in this place or in our private devotions or whether anything we do in this world, it is only acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.20 says you're built upon the foundation. Same foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building's fitly framed together. Every living stone is put in with every other living stone and fitly framed together and grows into a holy temple of the Lord. Every time he's adding one that he's redeemed, the temple's growing. It's coming closer and closer to completion. In whom you are also builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. God said, this is where I'm going to dwell. Brethren, David was faithful by God's grace. He was. But David was a sinner just like you and me and just like every elect child God saved. David was saved by grace. He was saved by Christ being his surety, by Christ being his righteousness. Every Old Testament saint was regenerated by the Spirit of God through the gospel and given faith to trust Christ and everybody God's ever saved been saved the same way. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life. There's no man comes to the Father but by the Lord Jesus. He's the way. Now thirdly, why did God do it this way? Why did he choose to do this? Well, because God chose Zion for his habitation. Look here in verse 13. Because the Lord, this is why he did all this. He said, because the Lord hath chosen Zion. He's chosen Zion. Look, let, let's read uh, let's, let's, let's read this together. If thy children would keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. For the Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. Now, temporally, to picture this, God chose that literal earthly Mount Zion. He chose that place. That one mount is where God said, I will dwell. He put the Ark of the Covenant there. He put the Ark of the Covenant 
at Jerusalem in the holiest of holies and said, that's where my presence, I'll make my presence known, that's where I'll meet with my people over that mercy seat. God refused the other tribes. Josh, uh, Psalm 78, 68 says, God refused uh, the other tribes, but He chose the tribe of Judah, the Mount Zion, which He loved. And He built His sanctuary like high palaces, like the earth which He has established forever. He chose David also His servant. But God did that to picture, to picture how God chose His Son to be the King and chose His Son to be the Savior, how God chose His people to be His Zion. He makes His people His sanctuary, His holy place in which He dwells. He does, Christ does that. Hebrews 12, 12, uh, Hebrew, Hebrews 12, 22. Let's look at it. You individually and collectively called in and, and fitly joined together with Christ abiding in you and God the Father abiding in Christ, making you to be one with the Father in Christ. You are the Mount Zion. And, and there's some in heaven, there's some in the earth. But, but look at this, Hebrews 12, 22. But you are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Here's what Mount Zion is. Here's what the heavenly city is. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven. That's who we are, the church of the firstborn, the church of Christ the firstborn, our names written in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Some of them are already in glory, perfected. Just men made perfect. To, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And in fact, you that are sitting here on right now in this earth are just men made perfect in Christ. <laughs> That's so. And you've come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, See, that we're talking about the covenant here. He's to me, he did all this. He mediated between God and his people. To his blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of, of Abel. God, when, he, when the scepter departed, Christ came, he finished the work, he fulfilled all righteousness for his people. And when Christ told him, your house is left desolate, in 70 AD, he destroyed Zion. He wiped Israel off the map in 70 AD. He used Rome to do it. And he's, God's never rebuilt it. And, and, and it's going to remain plowed from here on. Zion is God's elect. Zion are those that have been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Zion are those he regenerates by the Spirit of our Lord. Zion are those in whom God abides. It's his church. Some are in heaven, some are in the earth, but we're one in Christ. We've been made holy, his sanctuary, his abiding, his habitation, by Christ taking up his abode within us. Verse 13 the Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. That's the only reason. Adam, we didn't do anything. We didn't merit this. God desired to make you his people. What a... Oh, want to give thanks to God? We got a lot to thank him for, don't we? Mm. So now, let's hear what his promises are to us. Let's hear what his promises. Here's God's covenant promise to you and me in Zion. This is by our King and our Savior. God promises he'll bless his people with provision, with bread. That's what he's talking about, bread. Verse 15, I will abundantly, and the word is surely, and abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Every elect sinner that God saves is the poor. Everybody in this Zion, everybody in this city, <laughs> are by nature absolutely thoroughly poor. Everybody. Blessed are the poor in spirit. But throughout the law, God gave laws regarding the poor. 
All through the law, God gave laws regarding provision for the poor. And it all pictures what Christ has done and is doing for you and me who are so poor in our sin by nature that we could not do one thing to save ourselves. That's what the whole law was picturing. I'll give you some examples. I won't have you turn to these, but first place God speaks about the poor in the law. He says, if you lend money to the poor, exact no usury. Do not lend them and take interest. Do not do it. Salvation is by God's free grace. It is totally free to his people. God gives to his people, and he, he, he doesn't take from us. He said, who is first given to me, it will be recompensed to him again. It's all free. Then there was a law, he said this. This is concerning God's perfect justice. He said, thou shalt not countenance a poor man in his cause, nor rest judgment from a poor man in his cause. God's no respecter of persons. God, God didn't do this just because you're poor. What he's saying is, he wouldn't excuse our sin, he wouldn't countenance our sin and excuse our sin and our transgression just because we were poor, desperate sinners. He wouldn't do it. And he would not wrest judgment from us and, and withhold from us what is just because we were poor sinners. God's not a respecter of persons. He, he doesn't have respect to the rich and a different regard for the poor. God's just and holy in all His ways. What did He do? He sent His only begotten Son. And our Lord Jesus came forth spotless, perfect, the only perfect man since before Adam fell in the garden. He came forth holy, perfect, upright, and He willingly took the sin of His people. And therefore God justly poured out judgment on him and made him a curse for us and he satisfied that justice and by him now God gives his poor elect people exactly what justice says we deserve the perfect righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ so God is a just God and he's a savior to his people in Christ God commanded they let the land rest the seventh year so that the poor people may eat you know, I was thinking this the other day. I heard some people arguing, debating over what's the best form of government and, and laws and how we should fix the economy. If we could do just what God said do in the law and how he commanded them to let the land rest, forgive all debts in the seventh year, that's the best, that's the best government ever been, ever been given. And I guarantee you, we, we're going to see that one of these days. <laughs> but... Everything about that picture is Christ. Christ is the seventh. He's the perfection. He's our rest. He's our bread. And God's provided us bread, full, abundant provision of eternal life in our Lord Jesus Christ so we can rest and know He's providing all. All those laws concerning the poor picture, God giving us the living bread in Christ Jesus our Lord. And God's going to continue to bless us out of Zion. Christ is blessing us through this gospel. Scripture says, from Christ, all nourishment is ministered to the preaching of the gospel exactly according to his promise. He's, he's giving you the bread right now. He's making good on that promise right now, giving us the living bread. And so, according to his covenant, brethren, we should not worry and fret about the temporal provision we should never fret and worry about it. I do. I know you do. It's like we saw Sunday. We start looking with these carnal eyes instead of believing God, and we start worrying and, and, and getting afraid something we're not going to be provided for. He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God, godliness with contentment is great gain. You know, having God's blessing in your heart, having the gospel of Christ in your heart, and knowing God's going to provide, He's provided all spiritual blessings and He'll provide all temporal blessings, godliness with contentment is the greatest riches you could possibly have. That's the greatest riches you could have. So brethren, meddle not with Esau's portion. I want you to turn and look at this in Deuteronomy 2. I really don't have time, but I want you to see it. 
After 40 years, God commanded Moses to lead the children of Israel northward. And he told Moses to command the children of Israel something. Now, I'm saying to you, God's given you his full salvation in Christ, full abundant provision according to his promise in Christ, the living bread, and he will provide us all lesser temporal things according to his covenant promise. And seeing that he provided Christ the bread, we ought to not even ever have a doubt that he's going to provide the lesser things. But look what he told them right here. And here's what I'm saying to you. He told, uh, he told them, verse 4, the second part, he told them, The children of Israel shall be afraid of you. Take ye good heed unto yourselves, therefore. Meddle not with them. They, they're going by the children of Esau. He said, Meddle not with them, for I will not give you of their land, no, not so much as a foot breadth, because I've given Mount Seir unto Esau for a possession. You shall buy meat of them for money, that you may eat, and you may also buy water of them for money that you may drink. You can, God is saying, in this life, you can eat, you can buy, and, and your food, and you drink, whatever you need in this life, but don't go after Esau's portion. He said, For the Lord thy God hath blessed thee in all the works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness. These forty years the Lord thy God hath been with thee, Thou hast lacked nothing. <laughs> and so of us, brethren, that's God's promise. When David said, I've been young and I'm now old, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, I've never see, seen his seed begging bread, he was talking about spiritually, we're going to have Christ the bread, and temporally, God's going to provide you what you need. And he'll use brethren to do it. He'll, he'll, that's how he's blessing us, teaching us he, he's the provider. He'll give you a need, he'll give other brethren provision, and he'll give them a heart, remind them what Christ did for them, and they'll provide for you. The safest place a believer can be, as you near your older years, and, and the safest place you can be is with God's people, because it's God doing the providing. Safest place. Here's God's promise. Verse 16, I will also clothe her priests with salvation and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. We saw this last time. I'm not going to speak a lot on it, but this is what Solomon was asking for. God said, I've promised to do it. I'll do it. Christ made each of his elect priests unto God. Revelation 1.5 says, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. To Him be glory and dominion for and ever, ever and ever. He made us all kings and all priests by His blood. And through faith, He clothes us in Christ's righteousness. And that's what makes us shout aloud with joy. Perfect in Christ. Accepted of holy God. And never it'll never be otherwise. And when we sin, just like God promised David, when we sin, God said, I'm going to chase them, but I won't, I won't go back on my promise. I'm going to keep them. I'll keep them partaking of my holiness. The sin, you hate it. You don't want to commit it. But when you sin and God chastens you, it's just to keep us reminded He's our righteousness and He's our holiness and He's the one that's keeping us every step of the way. Every step of the way. And God promises great increase forever. Look here in verse 7. There will I make the horn of David to bud. I have ordained a lamp for mine anointing. Christ is the horn of salvation. It means the horn means it's plentiful, means he's powerful, means he's all salvation. And his horn buds, it grows, and Christ shall be our light forever. He's our lamp forever. Why is all this certain? Because the government's on Christ's shoulder. He said, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government should be upon his shoulder. The government of this house is not me, and it's nobody else here. The government of this house is Christ. It's on Christ's shoulder. He's the prophet, ruling. If I start making some terrible error, you pray for me, you trust, trust me to Christ, and ask Christ to correct me and keep me, and you wait on Christ to do it. And if he opens the door for you to speak something in grace, speak it. Remind me of Christ. Point me to Christ. And what you'll end up watching is you'll see the Lord Jesus correct me and he'll teach you in the process. 
That's so of all his people. The government's on his shoulder. Look, his name should be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase, the budding. It's going to bud. His horn shall bud. The increase of his governing and peace, there should be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment, with justice, henceforth from ever, even forevermore. This zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Christ shall call every redeemed child, and every time he calls one in, he's not adding a new new name in heaven. They've been on the written in heaven from eternity, but every time he calls one that he's redeemed, he's make he's increasing his holy nation. He's his kingdom is growing, his royal family's growing, and he'll make you increase personally as he teaches you by his grace through this gospel and through his providence. He's the lamp, he's the light. I've ordained a lamp for mine anointed, God said, and Christ is that light. So when you're in darkness, remember Isaiah 50, if you're in darkness, you believe Christ, you trust Christ, you, you continue trusting Him, stay upon Him, and you'll be able to, He will make good to you in this word right here, this promise, and you'll be able to say what David said. David said, Thou wilt light my candle, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness, and you'll see, He will. Christ is our light forever, brethren. And so by Christ now, God promised David and he promised us complete victory. Complete victory. Look here in verse 8. His enemies will I clothe with shame, but upon himself shall his crown flourish. Christ defeated all our enemies. Every enemy we have, Christ defeated by his perfect faith toward the Father, trusting the Father's promises. I want you to get that. He trusted the Father. God raised him and set him in his Father's throne because Christ, by his perfect faith, obeyed God even to the death of the cross and justified his people and declared God just in the process. Christ's crown of honor, his crown of power shall flourish and increase to all eternity. Now, you remember God's promise to us? Look at verse 12. He said, If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. Christ overcame the world by perfectly trusting the Father. He put away all our sin and, and justified us and conquered every enemy for us. And he fulfilled this covenant for his people and he's fulfilling it for you now as he's leading you the rest of this way. And by his power and grace, the only way you're going to overcome is through faith in Christ. It says, Scripture says, through faith and patience we inherit the promises. It's only through faith in Christ. He said, if you keep my covenant, in my testimony, he said, your children also sit in my throne, in thy throne forevermore. Go with me to Revelation 3. What Christ is teaching you, that obedience to him is, you believe on him. That's the only way you fulfill the covenant and keep the testimony. It's by believing on him. Confessing Christ. Remember, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. You overcome by Christ being your righteousness. You believe in Him and your testimony is you confess He's all my righteousness. Man with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness and with the tongue confession is made unto salvation. That's how it's, it's faith in the Lord Jesus and he said, you keep that covenant. The only way you're going to keep it, we establish it all one way through faith in Christ. He said, but if you come to me in perfect, the perfect righteousness of my law, he said, you'll sit in, you'll sit in, in his throne. Revelation 3.21. Our Lord Jesus says, to him that overcometh, that is, to him that continues believing on Christ to the end, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. 
but my faith is so weak. I'm like Peter. I'm looking to him one day, but then, then I start looking at the wind and the waves and I start sinking. How did Peter, how was Peter saved that day? He cried out, Lord, save me. And the Lord reached out and saved him, brought him into fellowship. That's how we're going to continue by faith to the end. You know why? Christ promised the Father he'd do that. <laughs> That's his covenant. He promised, I'll bring them all to you, Father, and he's going to bring them there. And every one of these promises we've seen, Paul said, all the promises of God are in Christ, yes, and in Christ, amen, unto the glory of God by us. I pointed out faith to you, Christ believing God's promises, and even when he was in darkness, he said, Father, I know you'll help me. And God the Father proved faithful. He fulfilled every covenant promise to our, to our King and our Savior. He said, He's the author and finisher of salvation to them that obey Him. He says, Come to me. Cast all your burden on me. I'll give you rest. I'll give it to you. I'll give you these promises. By faith and patience, waiting on Christ through the Spirit, you'll inherit every one of these promises. They're all yes and amen in and by Christ. That's the sure mercies of David, brethren. All right. Brother Greg. M56 will be our closing hymn. I am his and he is mine. Let's all stand together and